Our next speaker, Dr. Michelle J. Russell, is a research microbiologist and manager of the UC Davis Western Center for Food Safety, an interim director for the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security. One of her many projects explores the interface between production agriculture, wildlife, livestock, and the environment. Data from her collaborative research programs is being used to inform industry guidance documents and training materials, especially related to the Food Safety Modernization Act and the Produce Safety Rule. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation today to follow up with uh, Dr. Ingram's uh, excellent presentation and, and the other ones preceding him. I missed the morning, unfortunately, due to another uh, uh, series of Zoom meetings. Uh, and I have another Zoom meeting after this uh, with uh, students in China, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> it's gonna go into the uh, evening. Um, but I got talking with, um, with Robert about the uh, about this topic and with Chana Rock and doing something um, with the Southwest Desert because we had some funding down there, um, as well as other regional studies that um, Dave Ingram uh, alluded to. So I might have a little crossover with his presentation, but um, it'll uh, add on from the um, uh, university researcher academic uh, perspective. So my background is, uh, as mentioned, I'm a veterinarian, but also a microbiologist and I'm in the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis and um, I manage the uh, Western Center for Food Safety, which is the center of excellence in partnership with uh, FDA CIFSAN. So these studies I'm going to talk about are a combination of uh, FDA funded work as well as leveraged grants. The first uh, objective is uh, to give you some definitions. And I think you've, you've seen uh, quite a few of these through the day. Um, but it doesn't hurt to uh, emphasize again because it's surprising how much the word compost is, is misused, even in my own household um, by my husband who thinks anything that's gone into a pile is compost. Um, but you've learned that there's a lot more to it. Um, you know, in general, this, a soil amendment is any chemical, biological, phys physical uh, input into the soil. Uh, whereas compost has that specific requirement for validated uh, treatment. Uh, the benefits, again, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but um, you know, certainly uh, soil amendments are extremely important for, for our agriculture and human health and uh, having amendments uh, improve soil structure and uh, nutrients, all the benefits bacteria that can be can be part of that uh, community um, and uh, and in the case of um, animal based or, or green waste based uh, compost that's helping recycle uh, materials and, and keeping that loop going uh, in terms of where we get worried as you heard is uh, with raw animal manures um, untreated soil amendments and uh, uh, you heard the, the, the nice term for them, biological soil amendments of animal origin or BSAAO. I tend to um, shorten that just and call it raw manure, but um, keep in mind that, not, that, that it's more than raw manure. Uh, aged or stacked manure, uh, untreated slurries like our, our big dairies out here in California have lagoons. Uh, back in the Midwest, swine lagoons, um, compost teas that have a uh, that are brown, as they call it, that have uh, uh, manures in them, uh, are uh, also considered a BSAAO that's untreated and falls under the, the, the produce safety rule. And anything mixed together, such as um, uh, mixing together your neighbor's uh, goat manure with, uh, with your uh, kitchen waste, uh, that if, if that's not properly composted, that's still considered a, a, a BSAAO. Uh, what you see a lot in organic agriculture is, is uh, the use of some of these um, treated uh, soil amendments that, that do come from animals, but some of the other parts being recycled like bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, fish emulsion. Uh, these are all treated. Um, and so as long as that process is done correctly, they're, they're generally considered safe and not falling under the, the same uh, 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 
risk reduction strategies as, as it would be done for raw manure, but there has been some uh, concern about recontamination and regrowth and whether some of these have become so sterile or, or have other uh, have other interactions with, with the soil or plant that, that might uh, increase the risk, uh, despite uh, thinking that they were completely safe. And so that's going to be some of the research I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, just a really quick comment, because it always comes up, uh, uh, and some of these slides are, are modified from the Produce Safety Alliance grower training. The uh, uh, human waste and biosolids are, are allowed if they follow the EPA regulations. And there's um, an increasing number of, uh, of recycling plants that are now uh, working together with composters to, uh, to get these biosolids uh, actually combined with green waste uh, and, and more recently food waste. And uh, again, have a way to, to recycle. Um, whether or not it's a good idea to put these on to, uh, you know, what are the food safety risks, especially with some of these new emerging uh, type of uh, inputs, such as the food waste mixed with biosolids and green, green waste and garden waste. Um, regardless for organic production, since that was um, to be the focus of my talk today, uh, it's not allowed. So the, the, you're not allowed to use any kind of biosolids and um, and a lot of produce buyers for, for the covered produce, so, that, so to speak, under the rule that the, the produce that's going to be eaten raw um, generally steer away from the, the, the biosolids, but they're not illegal. Um, they, they're, they, there is an EPA rule to follow and use them. So uh, before I go into some of the data and research, uh, a, um, we have a, I'm gonna talk a little bit about framework for conducting this research and, and, uh, and then, speci and then uh, specifically for microbial hazards and, uh, and soil health. The uh, bacteria that we're worried about uh, include mostly enteric pathogens. So they're shed in feces and, and many of them come from animals. So these are not uh, Campylobacter E. coli 157, uh, the, uh, a lot of the salmonella is uh, out in a pre-harvest field setting. Uh, it's, it's very unlikely these are, are coming from human sources because humans are not, they get sick and then they, uh, uh, they don't keep shedding these after a finite period. So they're mostly a concern in food handling. But in the fields, we're more worried about animals and, and routes that uh, uh, getting from animal feces into water, uh, aerosols, uh, and soil amendments. Uh, parasites uh, are also of a concern. Um, but proper composting will eliminate these. Viruses right now are not uh, often coming from animal manure. Most of the viruses uh, might come from human sewage, um, so I'm not going to mention those too much. But the ultimate research question as we move forward in the context of soil health and organic soil and organic plants is how do these interact? So um, obviously uh, an E. coli 0157 cell is just is not in a petri dish on a special media, it's out in a really complex environment. We want to sort out what are the factors that where soil health can actually um, potentially be a, a mitigation strategy and, and sometimes it's assumed that that's the case, but honestly, there isn't, um, the data is not all there to support this. So we're doing uh, quite a bit of research uh, beyond just making blanket statements that healthy soil means that the, the pathogens won't, won't be there. Uh, and again, you know, we are mostly looking at animals, but some of these pathogens will persist a lot, a long time in the environment. So there may not have been a cow or uh, a pig or anything nearby uh, when you find these during uh, an outbreak investigation, uh, at, at that moment, they, it might have persisted and, and the contamination might have happened months earlier, uh, which makes it even harder to track these down. But part of what we're doing is using historical data of, of the survival of these pathogens and seeing if in a, in a, in a simulated ag production or even on a commercial location, uh, can we follow these pathogens or surrogates through and see how long uh, they die off in soil that's been uh, amended with different animal manures. Uh, then the ultimate, um, the holy grail, is to then put this pathogen information together with the soil health information. 
uh, including uh, how, how, what is the effect of microbial communities, beneficial microbes, and uh, we're employing some techniques um, with USDA ARS and uh, other universities, Cornell, uh, University of Maine, uh, doing soil microbial community profiling, uh, looking at competitive inhibition tests, and, uh, and then the big one, metagenomics, microbiome, uh, that, that uh, Dave Ingram talked about. And we have a freezer full of, uh, of soil samples to send to FDA that were about to go out, and then COVID um, came along. So they're, they're just uh, waiting to, to head out the door and, and uh, have uh, his team of experts look at those bacterial communities, and, and then we can turn around and compare with our findings from our, our research and pathogens and indicators. Uh, uh, also, we're collecting, uh, we have people on our research teams that are soil scientists, and so I am not, and so they help guide us in terms of what else to look at, uh, such as the physical and, and chemical parameters, soil pH and, and texture, carbon, uh, nitrogen, and so we're, we're also collect a lot of that data. And um, uh, two of the labs we've worked with um, are uh, the analytical lab in Maine that has a, a soil testing service. And then the Cornell University does a comprehensive assessment of soil health. And I'll mention at the end that, you know, what we're trying to do is create a tool that, that's like a soil health index that, um, that we could actually, once we reach the extension point of this project, uh, uh, go hand out to the growers um, as a tool. So um, this paper is actually the, the beginning of, of what, what became a, a huge program and, and the risk assessment that FDA is doing. Um, uh, Linda Harris in Western Center for Food Safety was uh, given a project and, and put together a team of those of us who have worked with manures and uh, to uh, really give careful consideration of, of how to design these studies because they're really expensive, they're time consuming. If you're doing something out in the field um, and, and you get a flock of birds in and they eat your, your whole, all your romaine lettuce, it means that you probably can't do the experiment for a whole nother season. And so you've just lost all of that, all of that effort. And, uh, and there's so many variables, it just gets to be a situation where you have to make a decision and just say, this is, this is how we're gonna set it up. And so what we've been really trying to do with the FDA funds and the leveraged funds and working with USDA ARS is to, uh, to be sure that we have um, as close, uh, as similar protocols as we can so that we can compare from one region to the other. In some cases, there's going to be differences. For example, it's going to be different what you grow out in the desert um, uh, down in Imperial Valley or Yuma than what you're going to grow in Maine or, um, or how you're going to uh, time your soil amendments in, in Minnesota. So um, we, we take that into account, but we try to keep some things similar. And we have uh, you know, our tools, we have, we have growth chambers, we can actually use human pathogens. Um, but once we get into greenhouses and, and outdoor, environments, um, we need to look at surrogates so we're not actually contaminated. And there's a lot of rules and um, uh, reviews, biological use authorizations. You can't just put these bacteria out without uh, scrutiny, which is a good thing. Um, you have to consider how many seasons, how many years, how much money depends, uh, helps dictate that. Um, you know, what kind of soil uh, based on our funding and just lack of data, we've, we've started focusing more on organic. And I'll talk a little bit about some projects with Alda Perez, who, who might be on, on the line and, and can also help uh, answer questions. Uh, but we've been fortunate to leverage uh, FDA efforts with um, Organic Research and Extension Initiative, uh, USDA funding programs. And uh, you know another consideration that you'll see in some of our data, what, what manures are we gonna pick? Um, that paper came out about you know where the most common manures being used by organic growers so we, we actually try to get the manure uh close to where we're holding the field trial um so then do what what we think the the growers are actually doing uh i mentioned organisms we can't put pathogens out but we there are well uh described e coli indicators uh and uh markers are interesting you, you, know, you have to ultimately in a field trial, be able to pull that bacteria out. So we use a, an antibiotic resistance marker, but it's naturally acquired. So it's not a recombinant. It's not going to uh, 
uh, pollute the environment. And, and interestingly enough, we've not had any controversy with, with that. To, uh, and we've had no problems using, using these strains. Uh, so my third part of the talk is to actually show you some data from our, from our trials. And uh, Dave alluded a little to this. One of the first uh, studies we did uh, down south here uh, uh, with Yuma, as well as uh, up in Northern California, was uh, look at what's actually in the in cattle and poultry manure in particular. We also uh, FDA commissioned a couple other states to to do this study over in Delaware and in Florida. So that data has all been given to their the risk assessment team. Uh, this study has finished up, but um, it was uh, pretty fascinating. This is this is in Arizona. Uh, showing a, a windrow uh, composting operation using steer manure and they, they truck it in every day. And um, we, we, this was um, summertime uh, when we got started. And so we got up at five in the morning to head out there at first light um, because by eight in the morning, it was getting to be 90, 100 degrees and crawling around in protective equipment in these piles gets uh, not only uncomfortable, but um, it's, it's actually unsafe for the the, um, the field crews. And so uh, amazingly, we took this manure back from this very picture and found a sugar toxin E. coli, despite that it's been out in the sun. In Northern California, we tested a lot of these um, uh, dairy solids where they, um, they separate the solids on the large dairies and then the liquids go into the lagoon. And uh, you can see uh, we're, we're digging out what they call guts and uh, taking surface uh, samples that they call toes. And uh, my lab did the, the work in quantifying the pathogens. And now those, um, any uh, pathogens that we found have been sent to FDA for whole genome sequencing and, and more characterization. And I throw this picture up because in this study, um, we had a parallel small farm study going on looking at prevalence of foodborne pathogens in livestock and, and produce at um, mixed uh, biodiverse type farms. This is a beautiful place up in the Shasta Cascade and this manure pile is a combination of uh, dairy and chicken and maybe some pig, uh, pastured pork, uh, pastured chickens and uh, micro dairy and grass fed beef and we found pathogens all over the place. Uh, it, uh, uh, throughout that study we just we discovered that you know this they don't feed grain and there was a question about you know the CAFOs the bigger risk and they are CAFOs obviously due to the, the sheer size is, are going to have uh, uh, quantitatively more uh, uh, animals that are shedding and, and that has uh, uh, borne out in our, our studies so they're absolutely CAFOs are, are a produce safety risk and, and getting manure from from them is, is a risk but I wouldn't necessarily look at a pile like this in this beautiful setting near Mount Shasta and think it's safe just because it's um, on a smaller farm. We, we, at one point we found E. coli 0157 at a pretty high high prevalence in, in, in this farm and then it would disappear. That's more, that's more what we find. We'll find that you go out, it's negative, 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 and then all of a sudden the, you're getting positives out of these piles and, and we're trying to sort through all the data and find out why, but it's not something as clear as just diet. Although diet very may, well may play a factor, but in a, in a, in, a, in and of itself, it's not um, uh, the end of the, the story. So um, this is just a little bit of the data. We're still going through it, but the bottom line is that we, for the um, uh, for each for overall for piles, um, we actually found more positives than I thought. Uh, uh, the pile prevalence was 31% and uh, the sample prevalence was 8%. And then in terms of concentrations, there's a fairly uh, wide range of uh, when we're actually looking at how much bacteria per, per feces. So it's a big difference if you only find one cell and you have to work like crazy to find that one uh, E. coli cell in, in the sample versus if you can easily isolate it and it's up in the, you know, uh, 10,000 or even million range with something they call super shedding in individual cows. And so this tool, being able to quantify has been really helpful uh, for the, our studies and for the risk assessment. So I mentioned the, um, the big organic study, uh, the OREI study that um, Alda Perez is leading and I'm a co-PI along with co-PIs in uh, multiple uh, states. 
Uh, this, uh, uh, we had huge support from the um, organic trade industry and, and uh, organic growers wrote, I don't think I've ever been on a grant with more letters. It might've been 22 letters of support. It was amazing. Um, and what was key to this, uh, the success of this uh, award, in my opinion, is that we, we, did, we did bring together the, the food safety with soil health. And that's our, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, is, is not just report out all the bad news, but see if, you know, is there some kind of mitigation or patterns that we would see that could turn out to be real things growers could use. So a lot of this data is being analyzed um, and some of it's been presented. This is a poster um, from uh, all those uh, uh, postdoc, Thais uh, Ramos, who also worked at, at Delaware uh, early in this study, uh, early in the other study, the pathogen survey. And uh, it's just, uh, we've generated just huge, huge amounts of data and are going through and um, something that we've learned, uh, you know, again, to, to get this off the ground, we did that uh, risk assessment that was published in Food Protection Trends to see, you know, what are organic uh, sales looking like? They're, they're very much on the rise, and including in the Southwest desert. It's a really growing market. Um, and uh, a lot of the top uh, commodities, especially crops, are covered under the, the produce safety rule, including uh, apples, lettuce, uh, spinach, strawberries, and so on. The, uh, uh, in the survey that, that we did, it, again, the, the big reasons that, uh, uh, that there was interest in, in using soil amendments, manure and compost, again, had to do with the whole issue of soil quality, soil health. And fertility. Uh, you've heard that uh, again going into this we, we queried the growers um, what they understood about various industry regulations, uh, audits, uh, voluntary programs like the leafy green marketing agreement. It's really quite confusing because um, each, each program is doing something a little bit different when it comes to raw manure and what growers need to do, um, if, especially if they uh, related specifically to food safety and, and wait periods, uh, uh, the time uh, between uh, applying the manure and then, and then having the harvest of the crop. The USDA uh, National Organic Program has a rule, but if you go to, the, to their website, they're, they're not, that's not, was not validated for food safety and that's not really their mission. They're, they're a marketing program, so we're doing a lot. Looking at that 90, 120, uh, day uh, wait period that, that uh, Dave does not uh, take exception to or, or the rest of FDA, but you know, we don't know that we're getting data where that may not be the best uh, time period uh, under all conditions or even some. Uh, so there's that hold period on, on the rule and that's the data. Out here in the West, as you know, with, with having outbreaks with leafy greens, um, anything that's even uh, remotely considered a higher risk is pretty much banned. So you, you can't use, you can't even use the, the NOP wait periods if you're an LGMA member. And again, just to illustrate this, it, it relates to the time of application and over to the harvesting, not the planting, the harvesting. So you have to estimate and, uh, and uh, uh, it's 90 days if the, if the plant doesn't touch the soil and, and 120 days if, if it does or if it's a root crop. So I won't repeat that. This is the actual paper if you want to look it up. I think we're providing the slides and this is all recorded. Uh, this paper goes through that survey uh, where we uh, used SurveyMonkey online survey, but also uh, mailed surveys uh, because uh, in the Midwest um, and on the East Coast, uh, a lot of plain farmers uh, don't use the internet. So we had, uh, we worked with extension agents uh, for the Amish and the Mennonite to uh, get hard copies uh, sent back. And uh, uh, what we ended up finding was pretty much, this part was not surprising. Um, uh, animal manure is being used for soil health, uh, nutrient management, soil tilth, the cost of it, especially for farms that have animals on the property or neighbors. Uh, and uh, composting is, is great, but you know, it's that, that pile I showed a little bit ago on the farm um, up in the mountains um, with the red barn. When I first got to that pile, I asked, yes, uh, I asked the farmer, uh, uh, she called it her compost pile. And then I said, well, how, how often do you turn it? Is it static? Uh, 
do you have a temperature log? And I, I got this just blank look, uh, no idea what I was talking about. To her, if you just stacked it in a pile like that and then took, a, you know, just went from the, the older side and pulled that and used that for the vegetables, that was compost. And so we've realized there's a lot of work to do to make sure that um, that definition is, is used correctly. And again, the, the sources were interesting. Poultry did not surprise me, but these were specifically, um, uh, yeah, cattle and horse, and then small ruminant for goats and sheep. And I believe these were specific to using these raw. In terms of for raw, because uh, this survey uh, encompassed a raw composted, composted, heat treated, uh, not just, uh, and, and also not just fresh produce. We were looking at what, what they were using on forage crops, like, like alfalfa or corn for, for livestock. Uh, something that jumped out uh, in terms of the raw manure, there was a, definitely a, a higher uh, percent uh, using it in the uh, in the Midwest. Uh, out here in the West for our larger producers, it'd be pretty unusual to see anyone using uh, raw manure. I'm, maybe in orchards, um, obviously in animal forage crops, but pretty much um, due to our, the, our uh, even though it's not banned, uh, our auditors and buyers uh, are, are, would be nervous about it. Uh, but it's much more common out in the uh, uh, in the Midwest or, or even uh, in the East or the South. For some reason, we did not get a lot of participants from the South in that survey. So I would call it regional, not, not national. Uh, so I'm gonna switch to another study that I'm pretty excited about and uh, it's going on right now. Um, I think we got samples uh, last week. Um, this is a, a field trial uh, that's uh, not on the actual farms. This is a, a experimental station that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, in Holtville, uh, and we're doing an organic and conventional romaine lettuce field trial uh, over there. It's about 60 miles from Yuma, uh, uh, called uh, uh, the Desert Research and Extension Center, or DREC. Uh, it's part of the UC uh, Cooperative Extension and Ag and Natural Resources. Uh, Jairo Diaz is the director there and, and co-PI on this study. And uh, he has an amazing uh, uh, location down there. And we were funded uh, for a couple of reasons. One was that there was an outbreak um, uh, traced to that uh, growing region in the Southwest desert. The Yuma region does extend into California and the Imperial region. And so it came a lot of concern to um, initiate studies. And, and there uh, is a longitudinal study going on that, that there was a press release about a year ago uh, that Chan is leading uh, in partnership with, with FDA and the irrigation districts. And then uh, at this experimental station, we're doing, we're doing field trials. And uh, this is a, a older Google picture, but uh, it shows that uh, this, this location actually is pretty cool. It has uh, organic fields, conventional fields, uh, it has a small cattle operation of com confined cattle, not, not a lot, about 300 head, 200 head, depending at the time, um, but in very close proximity to the fields and uh, also a manure pile. So Dave Ingram has been out there and got to uh, enjoy seeing the manure pile, which is still there. So um, we thought it was a really good little uh, place to do some directed experiments. And uh, other, other than getting from Davis to Holtville is uh, challenging, but we have an amazing team under Hiro that, that Actually, we trade them and they collect our samples and ship them up. And before COVID, we would go down there at least once a month to help. Um, but right now, we haven't we haven't been back. Um, but we are. We did get permission to continue the study in April because it's so time sensitive. We grew all that romaine and um, and we did hard. We got through the harvest in March, um, but that was right when everything was closing down, and we still had some soil samples and cattle samples. So uh, one of the aims, and, and this is an FDA funded study through our Western Center, uh, was to look at heat treated poultry pellets and see if there was differences in their ability to support the survival and growth uh, compared with raw manure and compost. Most of our previous trials had all been with raw manures. And so in this case, we bought local steer compost. Uh, we uh, brought down untreated uh, chicken manure and bought um, heat treated poultry pellets from a local dealer who delivered it out to the, uh, to the research center. And uh, 
these uh, uh, were then mixed into, um, we're mixed up a slurry uh, with a, an indicator E. coli bacteria at a very high level. Uh, unnatural, uh, unnaturally high, but to get data, we have to do, we have to fake it a little bit. Um, we can still extrapolate with the statisticians uh, on the die off, which is what we, we ultimately wanted to see how fast will it die off in the soil? You know, are there anything, is there anything that would cause it to regrow? And is there any difference between the different manures? And ultimately, does it um, transfer over to the lettuce plants? And so we are, uh, we've finished the, the, the romaine lettuce part. We're still testing soil. Um, this is inoculating the soil here. And, um, and then we uh, were planting the, the romaine starts. And uh, they, um, uh, our preliminary analysis of the data, we actually had more, more uh, contamination lasting longer than some of the trials we've done up in Davis um, with the organic, uh, the OREI uh, in terms of the soil. And, and we also, we um, continue to, uh, reco we're still recovering uh, some of the inoculum from unamended soil. Um, so that's interesting. It had no, no raw manure in it uh, or, or any of the other treatments. Uh, the uh, we're seeing a trend that uh, the the raw poultry manure is having the slowest die off rate, and the longest uh, or, or the, the fastest die off rate was actually in the heat treated poultry pellets. And um, we're, so we were discovering in this in this trial they were not higher risk. It was still the raw manure that was higher risk. But um, what interesting on our romaine harvest we had quite a bit of uh, uh contamination of, of the romaine we pulled the outer leaves off as they do commercially a surprising amount of um of contamination and, and davis where we've done some of these trials uh and tomatoes we've we've uh almost, i don't think we've ever found transfer of the inoculum um, especially growing on plastic but we have seen transfer uh under rainy conditions to spinach and we've seen transfer to root crops such as uh, carrots. So um, the you know the the other big part is that that some of these uh, persistence uh, this is going out to um, 120 days or even further. And so we're going to have to eventually re-examine the 90, 120 day rule. And this is the the last study I was going to mention. It was uh, looking at. Uh, uh, integrating sheep grazing um, in vegetable fields. Um, it's a, called, uh, some, t some call it rotational grazing. Uh, we called it uh, diversified farms or mixed crop livestock farms that uh, uh, might be using their, their livestock like sheep to graze uh, stubble or, or cover crops. And uh, these are considered sustainable, um, good for the soil health, uh, but putting animals intentionally out in a field that will be planted with uh, leafy greens or tomatoes is of, of a food safety concern. And so we're, we're this, these studies are finished, the analysis is still going on, and we find that using a generic surrogate, we do get die off, but, but this sheep, again, going back to that um, issue of grain fed or pasture, these are, are uh, mostly pastured uh, sheep, uh, and they did get, they do get transported sometimes, but in, in uh, the study, we, this study, uh, the first year of it, uh, the, the stack prevalence was 4%, and then we went back the next year and it was 60%. And so we actually saw a transfer of the pathogen into, into the soil. And so I'm pretty worried about this practice for really sensitive crops that are root or, or close to the ground. Uh, preliminary data, the, the future directions, I don't have any data. So this is, the truth is we've started to look at all that soil health data, but the, the, some of the so, uh, samples are sitting in the freezer, things got interrupted with COVID. And so we'll have to have this webinar again so that we can, uh, can actually finish the goal to have a, a soil health index and a risk versus benefit analysis, uh, putting all this data together. And this is my lab to thank and, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I do Twitter and I tweeted this picture out at one of our first field trials in Davis and it got picked up by NPR and the lab had a lot of fun uh, interviewing for, for that. And uh, here we are, I think that was 2013 and we're still at it, um, but mostly focused on organic right now. And that's, that's all I had. Our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Mitchell, is a cropping system specialist at UC Davis. 
He has worked with California's Conservation Agriculture System Innovation Center, which currently has over 2,200 university, farmer, NRCS, public agency, and private industry members and affiliates. He has come to us today to discuss conservation tillage practices in vegetable production systems. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, a number of years ago, I was part of a university team that was invited to go over to Kenya. And the, uh, the reason we were there was to, let's see how I can move this to the next one here. Was to, was to work with a number of villages and farmers in the eastern part of Kenya on different irrigation and water management strategies. And I remember the days we spent there very vividly because everything we said and that we heard was in, instantaneously translated for us. And I, the leader of the group was a Kenyan I remember him one afternoon saying, and he pointed to the three or four of us from California saying, look, look at these people here. They've come all the way from uh, the United States to show us how to improve our farming techniques. And that really struck me. I was taken aback by that. It, it was an uncomfortable statement in my reckoning there. And I wish at that point that I had had the wherewithal or the ability to maybe say something about that, because I'm not sure necessarily that there are great divides. Yes, we have great, extremely productive farms and outstanding farmers, but there are wonderful farmers all around the world. The things that we have in California, and likewise you in Arizona, I was thinking to myself, there are really two things. We have, first of all, developed water. In California, up until recent years, farmers have been able to uh, schedule irrigations, apply water uh, virtually when they want. Now that's changed with the drought, of course, and with restrictions, but that's been the history we've had. Another thing that we have in both of our states, uh, in particularly in annual crop systems, is we have very sophisticated equipment that allows farmers to prepare very fine uh, uh, seed bed conditions. Whereas in Kenya, people don't have, first of all, the water. The country is poor and does not have the ability or the capacity to develop uh, water systems, nor do they have the kind of tillage equipment that farmers are, are able to use here. So this afternoon, what I'd like to do with you uh, is three things, essentially. I'd like to provide some evidence First of all, ecological evidence, and secondly, economic evidence, uh, showing why we might be on the verge of needing to change some of the practices and the systems that we've relied on uh, for our cropping systems. And I wanna end with my third uh, section to show a group of some very, very progressive pioneering farmers that are doing just that. I'm not gonna talk about uh, annual or permanent cropping systems like vineyards uh, that we have in California particularly, nor am I gonna talk about permanent crops like orchards. The reason for that, I don't have that much familiarity with those. And also I think that if we're talking about soil health this afternoon as our main driver, uh, those systems, uh, it could be argued, I think are further along in terms of soil health management than some of our annual cropping systems that I'm gonna talk about. Now, at the risk of introducing some jargon or terminology, we've all probably heard of the, the terms up here in the right-hand corner, conservation or regenerative agriculture. And if you can see underneath the, the, the image of our, our the participants here, these terms have come to be defined by three main elements. First of all, uh, on the, the, in the middle there, that triangle, the red one, you redu we deliberately reduce the intensity of disturbing the soil. As a result of that, in the bottom triangle, you end up having residues that accumulate over the surface. And what you're also trying to do in conservation ag or regenerative ag systems is emphasize not only cropping diversity, above ground diversity, but soil biodiversity. 
So those are the core principles of conservation or regenerative ag. If you look on the left side over here, the NRCS principles of soil health are very, very similar. Minimize disturbance, emphasize diversity, keep the soil covered. My own mentor is a guy up in South Dakota, Dwayne Beck. He is also fond of talking about mother nature or natural systems. And those farmers who are interested in emulating or mimicking natural systems will remember that nature really doesn't do tillage. So there's a commonality of principles underlying what we're going to talk about and what I'm going to share about. That's about as far as I'm going to go, however, with the jargon or the language here. There are a lot of different terms that characterize these systems, and that's kind of ever evolving. But I want to share with you a little bit of the experience base for these kinds of soil health management systems. And this is a little bit uh, maybe surprising or unknown to many of us in the United States, but there are countries, particularly in South America and maybe in the Midwest of the United States, where there is tremendous farmer experience already at hand there. Uh, and it started in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay after learning some of the no-till techniques of farmers in the United States, largely out of desperation. They were losing soil to erosion and they had to change what they were doing. So my point here is there's a tremendous experience base, even in crops such as tomatoes down there, where they grow, 70% of the tomatoes are grown actually with no tillage there. So there's this farmer experience base. It's estimated that in the next 10 years, surprisingly, over 85% of the arable land in those three South American countries is going to be farmed using these very kinds of systems here. Another example, similar to the kind of rainfall we get in the San Joaquin Valley where I am today, in Australia and Western Australia, they're growing wheat, as many of you might know, with less than 10 inches of rainfall. No irrigation, it's all rain-fed dry land wheat there. And they've had to learn how to do that. In South Dakota, I won't, you can't read this, this thing here, at least I can't because the, the participants are, are blocking it, but farmers in the 1990s, they were literally going bankrupt. Uh, they were having, having to grow a crop every other year because they would do what is called summer fallowing in order to capture rainfall or moisture into the soil so that they could crop again every other year after that. Well, figuring out that that was kind of an economic dead end, they developed residue preservation systems, no-till, and they now intensified and diversified their cropping systems there. In California, and dare I say in Arizona as well, the annual crop vegetable systems are far from those kind of regions where those practices are, are implemented. I'll share with you a long-term study. We began this in the central San Joaquin Valley back in 1999. And what you're seeing there are some comparisons of different crops on the left of the, from the middle there are tomato vines that have been harvested to the right of the center of the slide are cotton that have been harvested. To the, to the periphery of those two main blocks are the green strips there. That's where we actually added cover crops during the winter time with no-till practices. So we've been doing this for a variety of crops for a good number of years to really test those core soil health principles in crops, in annual crops in our valley, uh, and see what happens there. The systems do not look like the ones I showed you before, the cleanly cultivated, uh, uh, residue barren kinds of system. There's a whole lot of uh, former crop residue in these systems and that creates lots of problems that have to be negotiated. But here we're showing the implementation of those practices. We're trying to extend the period, of period around the year of year-round cover, energy capture from the sun by growing winter cover crops. We're preserving residue in those systems and we're beginning to put the pieces together. This is what it looked like earlier on there when we were doing tomatoes. That's actually a tomato sled there, three rows, transplanting tomatoes right into the no-till cotton stalks and also the, the cover crops. Now, I don't want to give the impression this is widely done, but we were, we were forcing the issues and trying to bring the principles together there. Over the 20 years, we've seen increases by virtue of the cover crops of about 32 tons of organic matter or 15 tons of carbon into the, the, the no-till cover crop systems. We, we largely were relying on winter rainfall. So some years, like 2007, 
when it didn't rain or the rains came at uh, inopportune times, we didn't get, get very much biomass. But on, on average, we were getting about 4,500 pounds of dry matter per acre there as a carbon input. We've seen some very dramatic changes in terms of soil physical properties, particularly. What are seen here are the time in minutes for one inch of water, two, three, and four inches of water to infiltrate into the soil, to be taken up by the soil for the no-till cover crop system on your left, all the way through the standard till without cover crop system on the right. Very dramatic, uh, statistically significant differences have been seen here for a number of times. So we've changed the water dynamics of the soil in our systems here. Likewise, one of the key indicators that you've heard earlier throughout the day is the stability of aggregates, soil aggregates. How well does the soil stay together? And again, we've seen dramatic changes in terms of the stability of aggregates in our soils with the no-till cover crop one having quite higher uh, aggregate stability than the standard till without cover crop. Another thing that is fairly recent now, we've actually seen changes, and this comes from some research that's been done with some my colleagues at UC Merced, where the actual pore size, the, the, the size distribution of pores or holes that are in the soil has actually changed in the systems over time. And what uh, Dr. Temrat Gazezi and Samuel Araya have found is that we've actually seen now an increase in not only the distribution of different size pores in these soils, but also the water holding capacity of these soils. And it's been very carefully measured there, and it's, it's on the order of about 20% increase. Now, I don't, I don't want to be silly here with you all, but one of my aspirations is to try out for the show America's Got Talent, and I I'm going to probably enter in the magic category. And if this will work out, I'll show you what I mean by this. You've all seen this perhaps at some field days here. The two containers on the left are your standard till soils. The two containers on the right are the no-till cover crop soils. And we'll just watch for a few seconds here what happens. And again, you're seeing right before your eyes just the sheer utter disintegration of those soils. And I won't belabor this very much longer here because we have a lot to do and catch up on time here, but it's quite dramatic and we've, we've measured this in, um, in, our, in our lab determinations as well. From a microscopic viewpoint here, this is actually a soil clod or an aggregate that's been put in water just a few seconds before the video was started. And you're seeing again right before your eyes the destabilization or the instability of the aggregates there. Whereas if I move this over to the, let's see if I can uh, get this over here maybe. If you look over here, this is actually a stable aggregate from the no-till cover crop system. So this is the same soil type 20 years later after management has affected uh, a number of soil physical properties there. So it's, it's actually quite uh, dramatic there. My conclusion from the research or the ecological evidence is that there are dramatic changes in a range of soil properties. I haven't even talked about the biological attributes, but we've also seen them as well there. And the theory and principles would suggest that these are important. Now, uh, as part of their national soil health campaign, NRCS way back in 2006, so all those little rectangles around the slide there are different peer-reviewed publications that they researched and read to come up with their principles. And you've all seen these, we've all heard them throughout the day here, but I'm, I'm reiterating them again because they're very important, I believe, and that's what we've tried to show in our research. And yet, one of the things that I haven't talked about are some of the other so-called ecosystem service attributes or benefits that might come from these systems, uh, particularly in our arid and semi-arid areas. When you reduce disturbance of the soil, when you protect the soil with surface residues, you also reduce the amount of soil water evaporation. In our own research, which is very in line with work in Kansas and uh, South Dakota, shows that you can actually reduce soil water evaporation upwards of four to five inches just by doing those two practices. So in addition to soil function improvement, you're also getting the added benefit in terms of water savings. Now, the question becomes at this point, 
well, okay, particularly in farmer field days or extension meetings that we've had, is there really any evidence that soil health or soil quality is declining in the annual cropping systems in California? And I, I think it's a legitimate researchable question that could be addressed with different hypotheses. Up in Northern California where Davis is, they get about 17 inches of water on a normal winter rainfall. And it's not uncommon to see situations like this where water is going off the fields there or non-uniformly into the fields. A second question that I think we might ask is related to biodiversity of the organisms in the soil. Do we have an optimally functioning soil uh, biodiversity? That's a question we could test and look into. This is a farmer himself holding a field day about why he's using cover crops in his tomato systems. And for him, it was a question of water movement up, over across the beds and into the soil. Do we have uh, the desirable kinds of water movement and intake in our soils there? Most of the cropping systems that we're familiar with and that have developed with phenomenal success and high productivity over the last 90 years in California are far from the implementation of any of these principles. I want to just share with you another observation here that a lot of the research, a lot of the emphasis, as you can read in the middle part of that uh, white text there, there's tremendous emphasis on the efficiency of irrigation, but it's all technology. Drip irrigation with moisture sensors in the soil to time it better. Because of the tillage and the loss of biodiversity in the soil, we, you need more water because you're not capturing or holding water. It's farming on soils without structure or biodiversity. The real efficiency is biological, which few people are paying attention to. Let's, that, that insight has been recognized by California State. There's a round table that works on water management issues. And of all the places that water can exist in the hydrologic cycle throughout California and anywhere for that matter, one of the most underappreciated and unrecognized nodes or places for water to exist is in the soil. And can we, can we accentuate soil management as a means for improving the water cycle in our production systems? Now, much of, in both California and Arizona, we're obviously both irrigated areas, but only about 21% of the world is actually under irrigation. Most of the the vast majority of acreage that produces food crops for the world's population is not irrigated. And I think an, an extension of what I'm talking about here in terms of these benefits on water cycling of soil management, an article by Gary Spacito out of UC Berkeley. And if you really want to read a very extremely well written, very clear article, I encourage you to look at this one in the Vedas Zone Journal there. What he's talking about is our ability as farmers to increase or improve what is called productive green water flow. Now that's the water that goes through plants, that's in the soil, that goes through the plant body and is transpired up into the atmosphere. It's not conventional blue water sources and reservoirs and lakes and irrigation canals and the water that's used for irrigation, but it's enhancing the ability of farmers to have more green water captured and stored in the soil and also used for productive crop development and not soil water evaporation. So these kind of issues and these management systems are certainly important for us here in our arid states, but also in arid uh, rain fed areas around the world. Now that's some of the ecological evidence that I wanted to share from our own work. What about the economic evidence and what am I talking about this? Well, first of all, it's not your normal production cost study uh, evidence that I'm going to provide you. It's actually it's beyond that. <coughs> Excuse me. Steve Groff is a farmer friend of mine and a, a no-till cover crop expert in Pennsylvania. He's got a book that's called Far Future Proofing Your Farm that's coming out this, this fall. And what he's talking directly to farmers about is the following. He asked them, is your farm becoming obsolete? There are changes coming over the horizon our, in our industry that will have ripple effects and will, are forcing farmers to make difficult decisions about how they manage their soil. The reality is that you will become face to face with the supply chain that you're support, a part of. So what he's arguing here is quite bluntly and frankly, you're not gonna have markets if you're not making changes toward improving your systems there. I know that sounds strident, but a similar, 
viewpoint was expressed last year in Indianapolis, Indiana, in front of 700 people at the Sustainability Ag Summit there, where the vice president of Nestle's company, which is the largest food buyer and food provider in the whole world, said very starkly to the audience, if you want to sell your food to us, you'll need our specifications. That's the economic argument that I want to emphasize right now. Another aspect here is shown here that there's tremendous change in farming systems that's on the horizon. We all know of the average age of farmers being in the late 50s or 60s. In the next 10 or 12 years, it's estimated that half of the farmland in our country will change hand. That's gonna be an opportunity for people to make changes in how they're producing food here. Some other things that have caught my attention from Europe lately, and this, this growing produce quote that's right here, particularly just came out last year, talking about how American farmers, because of the legislation, the mandates that are happening in Europe are gonna be coming up against it in terms of reducing pesticides and reducing fertilizer use and in improving the, uh, the sustainability of their systems. Yet another piece of economic evidence that I'll throw out here today is young people. I think that there is tremendous interest uh, and uh, an aspiration improving the way we're producing food these days. I think we know at this point what improved performance production systems might look like. We have the principles, we have the theory that underlines some of these things. Now I think it's uh, how do we get to those principles? And it's not just gonna be young people, it's gonna be all of us. And as a proud lifelong baby boomer, I think that we all would like to be part of that process. I wanna to shift to my last section here, talking about some farm experience here with organic farmers. A few years ago, I was invited to talk back in uh, South Dakota, or no, it was actually in Kansas, I think, at the uh, No-Till on the Plains meeting. And a farmer from South Dakota came up to me after I, I spoke there and he said, Jeff, I got just a little bit of uh, advice for you. What you should do when you go back to California is take the hardest crop that you can think of and show that it will work. And he's talking about no-till soil health management practices. And for me, that was very, very aggressive, very ambitious kind of a challenge there. But I wanna share with you what, I, what we've done since there with some of the hardest crops that you can imagine. I'm very lucky to be part of a project that has involved about oh, 20 or so farmers. The majority of them are organic vegetable farmers throughout California's Central Valley. I'll just share with you a little bit about some of the, the pioneering experimentation they're doing. This is uh, a vegetable field here of a long-term uh, organic farmer who is now looking at opportunities to not only grow cover crops, but add reduce disturbance tillage in the form of strip tillage, and also add uh, grazing sheep into the, the rotation system there. So this is one of the experiences that is being looked at. Here's another experience, and I call this is a, uh, an organic vegetable farm over in the uh, western uh, ca uh, California place of Hollister, California. If you look at it, it looks very beautiful, very pristine production, very uniform on the right side there. Take a look on the far left of the slide, and that's where this farmer is now looking at residue preserving, reduced disturbance systems. You can get a closer picture of that right now. What he's trying to do here is put those principles into action, into play at his farm for a very high risk, highly uh, expensive crop of vegetables. And there are now uh, examples within our group of people doing just that there. They're knocking down and struggling with ways of killing organically the cover crops with a variety of rolling and mowing techniques, choosing the right cover crops and timing those termination practices at the optimal time there. Uh, and then using very reduced disturbance such as shown here for their uh, staked or pulled tomatoes here that, are work that they're working on. I'd, I'd be glad to share more of our updates from this farmer group here with anybody who's interested, just send me an email or you can get the, the links here. We do do a very good job, I think, of getting information out. And let me, let me close here now, uh, and Robert, I'll bring us back a little bit on time here a little bit. That meeting of No-Till on the Plains that I took part in a few years ago that really inspired me uh, and changed a lot of what we were trying to do toward reduced disturbance and uh, the kind of systems we worked on. At the end of that, 
that three-day session, everyone walked into the room, the big conference hall that morning, and we all noticed that there were piles and piles of books in the front of the, the auditorium there. And we figured, oh, this is going to be nice. We're all going to get a book there. And it was true there. Every, every single participant, and there were over about 1,300 farmers who were at that event there, we all got this book. And I don't want to belabor this too often here, but it's written by Howard Buffett, the son of Warren Buffett, who some of you know has actually farmland in Arizona, and it's called 40 Chances. And the challenge that the speaker of the No Till on the Plains conference made to all of us is, is related to the title there. In, in anybody's adult lifehood, lifetime, they have about 40 chances. We, we, we are young children, we grow up, and then we become adults, and we probably have maybe 40, maybe we have a few years if we're lucky, but 40 chances to do better. And what this book is about is about case studies around the world of farmers who are taking advantage of their, their 40 chances in very interesting and very innovative ways there. So it was the kind of inspiration that was quite meaningful to me there. And I just wanted to share that with you. We have lots of information at our Conservation Ag Systems Innovation Center website and, uh, and also many, many videos that sort of summarize the work we've done there. So lastly, the last comment here, and I don't mean to be name dropping books as often as I am here particularly, but if we look into the future, and Amanda Little is a, a writer who has done a really interesting job of doing that, and we can imagine what we will be eating and how it will be grown in a bigger, hotter, and smarter world, it, it's a very interesting uh, book to read there. And her conclusion is that it's not likely to be either or uh, high technology systems that are gonna feed us uh, well or uh, small scale agroecological systems. It's gonna be probably a combination or a third way forward is what we're gonna see there. So with Robert, I'll stop there, hopefully uh, just about right on time there. Our next speaker, Sharma Torrens, started her career as a wildlife biologist, then progressed into the field of general civil litigation in California, Arizona, and Washington, D.C. Later on, she transitioned back into a career focused on conserving natural resources, where she worked in a nonprofit group for a while, then transitioned into the Arizona Department of Agriculture as a legislative liaison, research policy analyst, and marketing manager. Now she is the conservation education director for the AZ Association of Conservation Districts, where she, amongst other things, helps to promote government assistance programs for funding conservation measures. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much to Robert, to U of A Cooperative Extension, and all the great entities for putting on this wonderful webinar. It's very important indeed. Soil health is critical, as you all know. Um, and I'm very humbled to be a part of this list of, of speakers, these esteemed, my esteemed colleagues, and they're all, they have so much soil health expertise, and it puts me to shame. I am not a soil health expert per se. However, I was asked to come talk about a few, uh, maybe some funding programs that we could use for soil health. So due to time constraints, I'm not gonna go into detail about too many of them, but what I'd like to talk to you real briefly today is again, yeah, I'm the conservation director, education director, Sharma Torrens, and I work for the Arizona Association of Conservation Districts. So I'd like to quickly tell you about the AACD, because I bet most of you do not know about them. And then also about the natural resource conservation districts, which we support. So I will briefly go over those two. I'll also explain how the AACD and these natural resource conservation districts, the NRCDs, are great partners with the US Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS. So I know this is a world of acronyms. I will go over those again. Most of you probably already know what those all are. But you'll understand why I'm speaking on behalf of NRCS. I do not work for NRCS, the US Department of Agriculture. However, they are a close partner of ours, and so I'll explain that as well. And then quickly, I'd like to just touch on three of their programs that can be used to target soil health. So let me see if I can get this PowerPoint to work. We've got some of my contact information there too. 
So if anyone needs to reach me, I think I'm having some issues. Maybe there's a delay in getting my PowerPoint to move. Okay, there we go. All right, so quickly again, I wanted to talk about the Arizona Association of Conservation Districts and I'm gonna call it the AACD. So basically, basically the AACD is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we work to conserve agriculture and natural resources. But we were established by the Natural Resource Conservation Districts in Arizona in 1944. So been around for quite a while. Basically what we do is we act as a means of support to help coordinate and fund conservation efforts across the state and to unify and represent district goals and interests. So the Natural Resource Conservation Districts, I will call NRCDs or I will call them districts. So we are there to support and promote the 42 Natural Resource Conservation Districts in our state. We have been working to support, support these districts and producers to conserve, as I said, agriculture and natural resources ever since, so 1944. I just wanna point out this map real quick. It's a map of our 42 natural resource conservation districts across the state. They blanket the whole state, and again, I'll tell you a little bit about them. So just so you understand who we are, because we were created by them and we are there to support and promote these districts. Okay, let's see if I can get the PowerPoint to move. All right, well, I'll go ahead and start. So the Natural Resource Conservation District, let me see. Hold on a moment, I think we're having some issues. So the Natural Resource Conservation Districts, basically what they are is they are, they were created in 1941 in Arizona, but basically they came after, in 1930s, the Great Dust Bowl, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Great Dust Bowl, when the erosion of the soil was so great across the plains that it, the dust reached the capital. Congress declared the conservation of water and soil a national priority at this time. And so there are 3,000 across the country. The states uh, put forth these conservation districts. They're called different things in different states here. They're na the Natural Resource Conservation Districts. And yeah, they were created in 1941. And so you can see then we were created, we were created in 1944, just a few years after. So as I said, there's 3,000 around the nation, 42 districts in our state, 32 are political subdivisions of the state. So basically they're administered by the Arizona State Land Department. So they're public bodies, 10 are tribal. So the NRCDs or the districts are hubs of conservation at the local level. They're hubs of conservation at the local level. And it's very important. They get a lot of great work done and I'll tell you all about this. But they work to conserve agriculture and natural resources, as I've been saying. They're basically comprised of farmers, ranchers, and other private landowners who are volunteering their time to conserve open space, wildlife habitat, migratory corridors, water, soil, etc. And they're giving up their free time for this. But how they do this is they work with federal, state, and local agencies and other entities to find conservation monies and funds for projects. And they work with all the private landowners in their district. And again, remember, they blanket the state. They work with the private landowners, the farmers, the ranchers in their district to get the conservation work on the ground. And these, these are called cooperators. It's almost like they're members of these NRCDs. So I, real quickly, just to end with the NRCDs, and again, I wanted to explain the AACD and the NRCDs, is what really makes them unique is the NRCDs work to conserve, as I said, wildlife habitat, open spaces, migratory corridor, as well as our food supply, which we all know is vital. We cannot do without. So also working to conserve our, our farms and our ranches. But what really makes the NRCDs unique is they have the ability, because they have this broad scope, to pull in some groups that don't necessarily always work together. Those that are working in the conservation realm, those that are working in agriculture, even those working in the food realm, food banks and other entities such as that. So they have that ability. The other thing that really makes them unique is that they, they also do education about the importance of agriculture and of conservation, and they do focus on children to adults with their education practices. 
But I think they're really key in educating the public about the importance of agriculture. As most of you know, there is a disconnect with our food and where the food comes from. And some folks don't even understand how important agriculture is to society and to all of us and to provide our food. And for so many other reasons. I was one of those, and I'm not gonna bore you with my story, but it was getting to know these farmers and ranchers and other private landowners that again, volunteering their time to conserve our wildlife habitat, migratory corridors, as well as our farms, ranches, et cetera, open space. And that's what really puts a positive spin on agriculture and changed my previous negative view about that. So I think that's another thing that makes the energy unique. Okay, so now describing, so why am I here talking about U.S. Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources, Conservation Service, and some of their programs. So NRCS, here's another acronym for you, works very closely with the AACD and the NRCD. So we collaborate, we are key partners. So the NRCDs connect the producers, so remember they're cooperators, and then can then connect those producers to NRCS. The NRCDs can help market NRCS programs to producers, which is always vital, because NRCD provides producers with financial technical assistance to implement conservation practices on working lands to help both the environment and producers up your operations. But what's key is NRC is non, NRCS is non-regulatory in nature. So they are basically there to help. But as you can see, they work with all the private landowners and the NRCDs have the connections with the farmers and the ranchers and the other, other private landowners. So there are very aligned interests here, because again, helping producers to conserve natural resources as well as their ag operations and keeping those going, because that's vital as well. Okay, just to get on to, to a few NRCS programs that can target soil health. So I'm gonna go over three of them. The first is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. So we call it EQIP. So here we go with another acronym, the world of acronyms. So the purpose basically is to provide financial and technical assistance to producers, our farmers and our ranchers, to address natural resource concerns and deliver environmental benefits. So that's EQIP. So the basics for EQIP. So it's a roadmap for selecting the right conservation practices for agricultural operations. And the key is to keep the agricultural operation intact, diversify income, and get them so that they can sustain their ag operations as well as get some environmental benefits. And we all know there's environmental benefits to farming and ranching regardless. But it helps you develop a conservation plan for the goals. There's about 200 practices under EQIP. They target water and air quality, surface, and groundwater, soil erosion, wildlife habitat, et cetera. And there's a cost share, a 75-25. So the 75% comes from NRCS, 25% from the landowner, and it's a reimbursement. So that's EQIP, but I'll tell you a little bit more about EQIP before we leave EQIP for you. So eligibility. So owners are renters of agricultural land. So farms, ranches, and forests. And forests. That makes you eligible. Conservation activities, general examples, dust control measures, fences, fire breaks, pond management, brush management, groundwater testing, high tunnels, ditch lining, pipelines, prescribed burning, sprinklers, wells, et cetera. You can see there's a lot of different examples of conservation activities or conservation practices as they call them. So soil health examples, just wanted to give you some that are covered under EQIP. Cover crop, crop rotation, nutri nutrient management, prescribed grazing, reducing tillage, salin reducing salinity, soil management. Applications for EQIP are year round. There was one that just passed in April, but I believe there's another one coming up soon. Okay, so that's EQIP and I apologize. I am just giving you the overview of these programs, but they're great and they can help target soil health. And again, I think NRCS has at least a few others that could help. Okay, let's move on. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program, so the RCPP. So that promotes coordination of NRCS conservation activities with partners that offer contributions to expand the collective ability to address regional natural resource concerns. So this is more of a grant program, but it's looking for a really collective unified effort with partners. So the basics, so they're looking for innovative solutions to conservation challenges. And we all know soil health 
is a conservation challenge. So this is one of the reasons I'm talking about RCPP. It, you have to have measurable outcomes to address resource concerns. The monies, now this is interesting about RCP, the monies go to our NRCS, but they go for the targeted projects that you applied for in that grant. So again, it could be targeting something about soil health. So it doesn't necessarily focus on soil health, but it could. And again, I think this is kind of a great program because they're looking for innovative solutions to conservation challenges and we all know soil health is covered under that. So standalone funding, about 300 million a year. And there's two funding pools, the critical conservation area, the Colorado River Basin, and the state multi-state, which is where you would work with different states um, on your RCPP. Okay, so eligibility on RCPP. Organizations that will partner with NRCS, because remember, this is a partnership program, a grant program. They're looking for the collective unified efforts to address and, and innovation to address conservation challenges. So organizations that will partner with NRCS, practices take place on a farm, ranch, forest, or eligible land. So that's the thing. So remember NRCS, the non-regulatory agency, works with private landowners, the farmers and the ranchers, to sustain those ag operations and sustain some environmental benefits and work on conservation. So the activities covered, and these are also called practices, just like with EQIP. So it could be things like conservation easements. NRCS has an agricultural conservation easement program called ASEP. So that is covered under the RCPP, as is EQIP. So remember, I just went over EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, which I will be talking about next. And they cover a few other programs under RCPP as well. But remember, you have to target a program, the, the monies go to NRCS, and then they are geared towards the project or activities that you have designated for that. So timeline for this RCPP, it will be coming out this summer. We expect it, well, as I'm told, and again, I don't work for NRCS, but as I'm told, we expect it in the next month to open up. So look for that RCPP. All right, moving on to the Conservation Stewardship Program. And Robert, I believe I only have a few slides on this, so hopefully we're staying okay with the time, the time limits. But basically, you're looking to maintain and implement producers' existing conservation practices and adopting conservation practices. So CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, is great in that it rewards farmers and ranchers for what they are currently doing with conservation practices and what they want to do. And it's not a reimbursement basis like EQIP, it's basically rewarding them for implementing those. It's a five-year contract, it's financial and technical assistance as well, just like EQIP, but unlike EQIP, no cost share. So the CSP hasn't been too popular in the Western states, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, but we are trying to really promote, help NRCS promote this program because now they have really opened it up to, to ranchers and farmers in the West. So eligibility for the CSP, producer with effective control of the land. So you only have to be an, a lessee or a tenant. You don't have to own the land. And private or tribal land that produces an agricultural commodity. Okay, so here we go. So 2018 Farm Bill made the public lands eligible. So as many of you know, in the West and in Arizona, we have a lot of public lands. Our producers lease lands from the Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, State Trust, or State Land Department, et cetera. And so before the 2018 Farm Bill, public lands were not included. So you could see why CSP was probably not so well liked out here in the West. But now, again, public lands included, and you can be a lessee or a tenant. So basically what you're doing is you're meeting or exceeding two natural resource priority concerns and meet or exceed for one additional by the end of the five-year contract. And remember, this is more of a reward program for what the producers are currently doing and what they want to do to enhance their ag operations and enhance the environmental components on their farm or ranch. Okay, so conservation activities. General examples, soil, water, animal, plants for farmers and ranchers, wildlife friendly fencing, pond management, riparian buffer, wildlife habitat, et cetera. 
And here's some soil health examples. So there's a lot of soil health practices under CSP. Crop rotation, reduced or no tillage, reducing compaction of soil, multi-species cover crop. We just heard how important multi-species cover crop and, and cover crop and reduced tillages. Um, mulching, organic matter input, eliminating use of chemical treatments, prescribed grazing or grazing management, et cetera. I should have put in et cetera, because there are many soil health practices under CSP. So unfortunately, there was just a deadline as June 1st. However, next year we expect an earlier deadline to open up for the CSP program. And you could see how that could really help provide funding, the reward program to target soil health practices. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Robert, U of A Cooperative Extension, all the great entities who put on this important webinar. Again, it's, if I work for the Arizona Association of Conservation Districts, we work very closely with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. One of our partners, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I can either put you in touch with one of those experts over there. Um, also, if you have any questions, would like to get involved in our Natural Resource Conservation Districts, and would, we do blanket the whole state, and they are aware of a lot of funding. They work with a lot of federal, local agencies and other entities with conservation funding and in education and a lot of different things, please let me know. You've got my contact. The website is aacd1944.com. With that, Robert, I hope I saved you some time with all this. And again, thank you so much to everyone for listening and thank you so much for the invitation.